Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to give everybody a chance to hop on here. Uh, while we wait for everybody, I am going to pop up some poll questions. Um, I'm going to launch the first one here, give you a chance to answer that while we let people kind of get situated. Uh, so go ahead and answer that. And cool. I see some answers coming in. What is your most popular social channel? Yeah, I'm actually really curious to see what everybody's most profitable channel is. Yeah, this is interesting. I'm surprised TikTok is so low right now. I feel like it's all the rage right now. Oh, I can't even vote. So I can't even see the answers. I'm curious to see what it ends up being. Oh, you can't see them. I guess I can only see it as the host. So here, I'll go ahead and well, we still get some answers coming in. Yeah, I guess we can wait. What did you expect to be number one? I guess I was thinking maybe Facebook, just because I feel like a lot of people run like Facebook ads, but clearly right now LinkedIn is by far in the lead. So here, I'm going to end this one and share the results so that everyone can see it. Interesting. LinkedIn, then Facebook. Huh. That's cool. Interesting. Cool. All right. I don't know the second question, but I'm curious, like, what people... Oh, I'm sorry. Poll that will pop up while we give some people... There we go. Launching the second poll. So this one's just how many years you've been selling. It's always good to kind of see the range. Getting some answers in here now. <laughs> Looks like we got a lot of kind of newbie range, zero to one year. Seems to be the strong lead right now. Yep, looks like we have some kind of newer sellers. So this is obviously a great workshop for you. Learn how to use your social media to build your email list. Awesome. All right. So it looks like we have some people hopping on here. Um, I'll go ahead and kind of get started. Uh, thank you, Chase, for being here. We're super excited to have him today uh, for this workshop. He is going to be leading us through, you know, how to use your social media to really build your email list and, um, you know, really utilize that. He's a e-com email expert. He's been in the game for a while. So uh, definitely a good you know, a good person to listen to and get some really good insights from. And uh, yeah, I'll let him take it away and get started with this workshop. Uh, a few housekeeping things really quick, though. Um, please feel free to drop questions in the Q&A um, or the chat. I'll be monitoring those. Um, we'll probably save all the questions for the end uh, of the, you know, the presentation, but uh, we'll try to answer some as we go. So with that, I will kick it over to Chase. Thank you. Yeah, I was just making sure this chat was working because I hadn't seen anyone, but I see a couple coming through. Cool. Let's see. A bunch of people said hi from where they're from. I'm from uh, Orange County, California. And then Katie, you're in uh, your Austin, Texas office. Yep. I'm out here in Austin, Texas. Um, so I didn't even introduce myself, but I'm Katie <laughs> and I'm with 8FIG. And uh, yeah, we're out in Austin, Texas. Cool. All right, sweet. Well, let's, let's do this. I'm excited. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, let me know... If you guys can see it all good. Looks good on my end. Oh, cool, looks good. Um, all right, let's get started. So pumped to talk about one of my favorite things, you know, something I don't see a lot of people talking about is how to grow email lists through social media. It's something I've been working on, you know, pretty intense over the past couple of years. Couple quick notes. So background, I'm a partner at an e-commerce marketing agency. We're now up to about 130 team members, working with about 150 clients. Um, we've sent about a billion plus emails, done about $150 million in email revenue over the last five years. Uh, my weekly, a few times a week newsletter now has over 100,000 subscribers. 90% um, of those come from social media. So that's really the topic that we're talking about today is how, how to do that, how I've done that, how you can do that. And then on social media across the platforms we're going to talk about today, which is LinkedIn and Twitter, um, but... 230,000 on LinkedIn, 122,000 on Twitter. And across those platforms, I'm getting over 10 million content impressions per month. So let's dive into what we're going to talk about today. So the goal and the kind of the takeaways of this, and I think you'll get the deck and maybe the recording after. So uh, maybe just pay attention. Don't worry about taking too, too many notes. We'll get you guys everything after. Um, and by the way, Katie, are we recording this? I want to make sure we're recording this. Yep. 
Okay. Yep, so this is being recorded and within 48 hours, I will have the recording out to everybody. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Perfect. Um, sweet. So the takeaways today is you're going to learn how to leverage social media to build a large and highly engaged newsletter. And with that, I'm going to show you guys actionable tips you guys can use to funnel traffic to your newsletter. And I'll show a bunch of examples. And if we have time at the end, we'll do a bunch of questions. And I think we will have time. So stick around. All right. So first off, why email? Why social? You know, I think that's obviously fairly self-explanatory. You know, email for all these reasons. Email is such a tried and true channel. The personalization is better than anything else right now. It's extremely predictable. So unlike Facebook or any other advertising platforms, email is very predictable. You can see historical data. You know what you're going to make kind of on a monthly basis, give or take a little bit. Uh, it's very profitable. You know, you're paying to acquire these people. And then from there, anything that you make via email outside of what, whatever you pay your email provider and whatever your team costs are is, you know, typically profit, obviously, outside what your product costs. And then it's very conversion focused. Most people sign up to newsletters and email lists to buy more so than social, at least. And then why social? So while emails, all those things, emails only as good as the traffic and the leads we have coming through. And that's why we need social. So with it, you have the ability to go viral plus ongoing consistent traffic, right? So whether you're on TikTok or LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, et cetera, there's the ability to go viral. You know, lots of people do. Obviously, lots of people don't, but lots of people do. It's a great way to test content. So for me, I use social media to get real-time feedback on content that I might want to share longer form than newsletter. And then you can boost organic posts with ad dollars. And I do this on Twitter to drive more followers, engagement, and traffic towards my newsletter. Okay. And then real quickly, I'm going to share my results. And then we're going to reverse engineer how I got those results. So kind of starting with, you know, why you should listen and kind of what it's done and then how you can do it too. So uh, this screenshot was from, from March. This is a couple months old, but you can kind of see on uh, LinkedIn, I went from 24,000 to 182,000 um, in about a year. You can kind of see the growth on LinkedIn. Again, these are kind of older screenshots, but at the time, 29,000 of my subscribers had come from LinkedIn, and then 38,000 of my subscribers had come from Twitter. And now I think you know the LinkedIn one is mid to high 30,000s, and then the Twitter one is, I think, in the 50s. So it's it's been really successful for driving lots of newsletter growth. Um, and what, what is the outcome then, right? So over 100,000 email subs, a lot of it's come from Twitter and LinkedIn. You know, the newsletter and the social channel as their own assets will do, you know, mid six figure in revenues from various sources, things like newsletter and social posts that doesn't include like sales from the course or agency clients or consulting. Um, every single month, it drives dozens of leads, gives lots of speaking opportunities. I get to connect with some of my idols and so on. All right. So how, how can you do this now? Right. You've seen what's done for me. How can you do this? So let's talk about like the 101 and then we'll work up. The thing that you have to do on LinkedIn and Twitter is you have to pick a niche, right? This is universal in social media. And you have to find your niche based off a couple of things. It's at the intersection of what are you good at? What are other people also interested in? What can you make money about? And what is something that you're deeply passionate about? What's something that you could talk about, research, learn about, share about for forever, right? If you could find like that intersection of those things, that's amazing. For me, it was email, right? For you, it could be email, it could be ads, it could be Amazon, it could be e-commerce, it could be a whole host of things. Anything that you're really good at, interested in, and there's a target market that's willing to pay money in one shape of another. Um, and then with that, right, once you've kind of become the person, you want to have a memorable personal brand. So you want to start branding yourself as the email guy or the email girl, the Amazon guy, the Amazon girl the LinkedIn guy, the LinkedIn girl. And with that, you want to have a simple handle and a name that's specific for Twitter. You want your handle to be something easy, somewhat short, you know, memorable. You want to make sure that you have a professional kind of good looking profile photo. You want to make sure that you have alignment across the assets and written text. So essentially your bio, your banner, your profile photo, everything there needs to tell the same story and be related. And you want to be remembered for something. So going back to the first point I mentioned, be known as something. And how do you get people to know you as something? You have to start branding yourself that way. The email guy, the Facebook ads girl, the more often that you refer to that self, 
no one started telling me I was the email guy. I started telling people that I was the email guy. And now they're telling me back that I'm the email guy. So you have to brand yourself in a way that's very memorable and very specific. And with that, um, I believe in building out this profile matrix. So one of my buddies had helped me build this out a while ago when I first started on Twitter. Um, and you want to be able to define, you know, in a Google document, in a sheet, on a whiteboard somewhere that's really clear and crisp, all these different things. So this is my voice, but you want to define your own voice. So my voice is no polarization. I want to play nice. I don't swear. And I want to be uniting instead of creating differences. Whereas you see people on social that are very much the opposite. They're very polarizing. You know, they don't care about offending people. So you just have to find that voice that's authentic to you. It doesn't matter which it is. It just has to be you. And it has to be something that you feel good about and something that people can kind of can resonate with. And then you want to have themes and beliefs. So for me, it's things like email marketing, copywriting, e-commerce, building an agency, family, sales, and systems. These are all the things that I believe in, you know, and are really core to my life and are really important to me. And with that, you know, things I can draw experience from. So my experience is my jobs, my relationships, my failures, my lessons, my aspirations. And with that, it then lends itself to different styles and structures of posts. You can have posts that are comparing things. So, um, you know, email now versus before, um, things like industry statistics, you know, did you know that email produces this much revenue per lead in this industry um, before or after? So before they started implementing all their email flows, after they started implementing their email flows, and then different types of screenshots. So it's really important that you build out a profile matrix for your, your personal brand or your brand that just talks about the things that you guys are uniquely capable of doing and, and you believe in and the things that you guys can draw from. And then with that, you also have what's called a trust profile. So you want to have kind of these different types of things that you guys talk about. So for me, it's these four A's. These are what all my posts stem from. Some talk on all four, some are specific to one. So actionable posts. So for me, it's giving tactical, implementable advice on email marketing, on copywriting. That's really what drives people to build that trust with you as a practitioner, someone that knows what they're doing someone that's doing it day in and day out and is sharing their learnings. Then you have aspirational posts. So I shared a post yesterday on social talking about why I started an agency. So this story of growth, I started an agency seven years ago because fresh out of college, no agency would hire me and I don't blame them, right? I had no agency experience. So I wanted to show to myself and them that I could do this. And of course it turned out in the beginning, I had no clue what I was doing and I wasn't capable of doing it, but I stuck with it and seven years later, you know, we're doing okay. So kind of sharing the aspirational stories really make yourself relatable. Too many people, I think on social, share just the wins, not the losses. So finding ways to tie the loss into learnings and kind of wins and things that other people can do as well. Uh, things that are analytical. So it's really important that you share kind of numbers and data and those types of insights. So for me, I study email, I study e-commerce, I study copywriting. And I'm extracting the data and the statistics and the insight to share with other people. And then the last one is anthropological. And this is the study of people and behavior. So I did a post on Monday talking about like the psychological, uh, the psychological principles of copywriting and the different types of things that you guys can leverage to make people take action. Uh, you know, FOMO, the fear of missing out, and these different types of things, countdown timers, and how you guys can leverage the psychology and how people think and how people are wired to get them to take an action. So that's kind of the trust profile. So again, we're kind of building. So, you know, this is the 101, we're kind of building to be a little bit more advanced as we go. And I've got a bunch of examples. So we wanna make sure that we pick a niche, we have a personal brand, we've built out our profile matrix and our trust profile. So why should people listen to us? What are the things we're gonna talk about? How are we gonna talk about them? How are we gonna display them? And then kind of some quick tips before we go into a bunch of other things. So. Um, number one, you have to be consistent and patient, right? I've been posting on social media since 2017 pretty consistently, but people are just starting to find me over the past 6, 12, 18, 24 months. So for years and years before anyone found me, I think it was like my mom and my wife were like my only followers for many years. Um, if I had thrown them in the towel, I probably wouldn't be here today. So you have to be consistent and patient. You have to ma match quantity and quality posts and you need the right mix. Um, it's really like building a muscle, just like when working out, 
you need to get your reps in. It takes a lot of reps and a lot of practice to be good at creating content. And you have to just be consistent with it. Um, again, optimizing your profile. So the way that I look at like your profile page is this is essentially your landing page. So when we're all optimizing and doing conversion rate optimization on our e-commerce stores or our SaaS sites or our personal brands, the same thing applies for social media. You want to make sure your username, your profile picture, your bio, your pin tweet, all these different items are your best foot forward. It's showcasing who you are and quickly and basically legitimately showing why you are who you say you are and why someone should follow you. So for me, people should follow me for daily email marketing, copywriting tips from, you know, a hundred million, 150 million plus in email revenue. That's why you should follow me, right? Why should someone follow you? It could be that. It could be a whole host of other things. You want to make it your post easy to read. So you need proper spacing. You want unnecessary words to be deleted. And just make sure that it looks good, that it's easy to consume, that it's scannable. Um, and I wrote about this topic called like the F pattern, where people lead, kind of read from left to right. And it kind of follows this F where like they kind of go from top, skim to the right, then they go down, skim to the right, and then they kind of go down towards the bottom. So you want to make sure that yours follows that same pattern. The other thing is too, you want to make sure that more often than not, especially in the beginning, that you're offering value. And value doesn't just mean one thing or another. It means a couple things. You could either be really educational, you can be really informative, you can be really funny and entertaining, be really helpful, right? There's different ways to offer value. And depending on how you view the world, depending on your experience, depending on who you want to attract, that's how you're going to offer value. And it comes in different shapes and sizes. You want to engage with your audience. So you have to respond to comments. You have to respond to DMs. I've made this mistake a number of times of not engaging back. I mean, and it disincentivizes people from wanting to engage with your personal brand or your company. So if you're going to post, you got to spend time and allocate time to engaging and being helpful and responding. And then you want to also spend time engaging with influencers, micro-influencers, brands, people, et cetera. You want to comment on the posts from their accounts. And then the magic happens in the DMs. The more that you can DM and respond to DMs and add value, the better the bond and relationship is going to be with your followers. Okay, so we've talked about like the basics. Now let's talk about why we're here today. How do you acquire email subs from social? So I got a bunch of ways. So I'm going to focus first on LinkedIn. So these are the lists of ways, and I've got clear examples for each one. So this is kind of a laundry list. I'm just going to rapid fire them, and then each one will have its own screenshot and section. Link in bio, the featured section of your profile. We're going to talk about updating your post description. This is something that not a lot of people do that more people could leverage. Uh, posting a link in your comment section, same thing. Uh, dedicated posts about your newsletter. Having a LinkedIn newsletter and driving traffic to your own newsletter. And then some kind of viral content that leads to a lead magnet. So let's dive into these one by one. Um, and, and by the way, I know I'm going kind of quick. So far, are we all good? Making sense so far? Thumbs up. Yes. Okay, cool. And we'll have time for questions at, at the end, I promise. Um, so link in bio plus feature section. So when you think about like your LinkedIn profile, right? You go to it. Um, there's a section right here. I don't know if you can see where I'm hovering, but under where it says Tustin, California, contact info, it has this little thing that says email marketing newsletter, right? So I'm getting, you know, thousands and tens of thousands of people looking at my profile every week. So this is kind of something that a lot of people click on and you can have a custom UTM, a custom tracking link if you want um, so people can see it. They've also recently updated the ability to have like a button. So I switched away from just having kind of this text to a button that says, you know, visit my website or subscribe to my newsletter, something like that. So you really want to take advantage of, you know, this real estate here. And then also too, um, you can have like in this featured section down at the very bottom of the screenshot, you can have different things. So I've kind of pinned my LinkedIn newsletter and then I've pinned other posts that have content and kind of a link to my newsletter. So this one's fairly straightforward, very easy to do. The next way that you can drive traffic and you know to your newsletter or your website is updating your post description. So what I'll typically do is I'll make a post and then after it's going viral and viral is different for everyone. You know, For you, it might be 25 likes, it might be 500 likes, it might be a thousand likes. You know, for me, typically when a post will hit north of a couple hundred likes, I'll go in and I'll edit the post. So you can see here, the LinkedIn, it says it was edited. So I will go in and add this PS, you know, join this many people. Um, and I've just been lazy. I haven't updated the amount, but 
go update and go subscribe to my newsletter. So just by adding these plugs, you know, I'm able to drive hundreds of people every time I do this to my website. And then, you know, 40, 50% of those people will convert to newsletter subscribers. So post a really cool piece of content and then update the content to have some kind of call to action. Um, same type of thing, adding a link to your comment section. So just like I add it to the description of the post, you know, after a post does well, I'll just go and add it to the comment section. So that way, if someone's in the comments, they might see it. And if someone's looking at the post, they might see it. Just different ways to drive attention and kind of call to actions to the things that I want them to subscribe to. One other thing that I do too, is depending on what the post is, you know, if the post is something about, let's say copywriting, I'll send them to a landing page that talks about my copywriting newsletter. If it's about email marketing, I'll send them to my email marketing newsletter. And the text will be a little bit different. This one says free copywriting one. The other one might say, hey, my free email newsletter. So it's really contextualized to the post. So this is uh, Justin Welsh. He's a big LinkedIn guy. This was a post that he made. Um, th this was, I know I'm talking about LinkedIn. This is one that he made on Twitter. This was just an example that I saw, but the same thing applies on LinkedIn. So what he basically does is he does a specific post about his newsletter. He goes, I've been noticing a big change on LinkedIn. My impressions to email subscribers plummeted. Last month, I figured out how to how to forex it. It's all about how you position the URL. I'm going to break this down in my newsletter tomorrow. And then he links to his newsletter. So just having dedicated specific posts, driving call to actions and traffic to your newsletter, it's very, very good way to do it. And it's, it's very obvious, right? Um, a LinkedIn newsletter to your email newsletter. So LinkedIn has a newsletter. I've got almost 100,000 people on my LinkedIn newsletter as well. My goal is to move people from my LinkedIn newsletter to my actual newsletter. I'm way more active on my actual newsletter. It's way more valuable to me. So I'm trying to use my LinkedIn newsletter to drive traffic there. And I'm using lead magnets and high value you know, content to send people there. So I, I have a 10 copywriting frameworks cheat sheet. It's free. All you have to do is go grab it here. Um, and they just have to opt into my newsletter to get it. And then I'll send them an email with it. So leveraging kind of the, the rented audience, the social audience to drive to the owned audience. Okay, so viral content to lead magnet. So I was doing a lot of content around ChatGPT, AI, prompts, and whatnot. And I did this carousel, right, that had 25 prompts. And I noticed a lot of people were saying like, hey, this is sweet. But then I have to retype each one out. Like, do you have a written version of it? And I was like, oh, wow, this is a great idea. I should go create a written version. So I basically took all the prompts from the carousel. I put it into a Google document. And I basically just said, hey, if you want the written version to go here, it took them to this landing page. They had to enter their email. And you can see from one post, I had almost 4,000 people give me their email. So this step is very, very valuable in terms of hiding, creating like viral content and then directing towards a lead magnet. Okay, so that's LinkedIn. Um, Twitter, similar, but a little bit different. Let's talk about Twitter. So the, kind of the main things here is a link in bio, updating the last tweet of a thread, having a second tweet under your popular tweets, and then dedicated posts about your newsletter. So some similarities. So again, in your bio, you want to have some link to the your website, your newsletter, you know, something that's like a link tree, a card site, whatever it might be. So that way you can send traffic to the links that matter to you. Um, the next thing is like after you have a thread or a popular tweet, you want to have a tweet that says something like, P.S., I do this, join other people that receive that, right? So just by having traffic there, you know, depending on how well your first tweet does, this could drive a few clicks. It could also drive hundreds of clicks. The most I've had is I've had like a few thousand clicks on a link and I probably got 500, 600 subs from a single thread or a post. So these can do really, really well. And the more consistent, the more frequently that you do this, you know, the more often that you're going to be able to drive people to your site. Um, same thing, right? So this was what Justin did. Same example. This was on Twitter. Um, and then rapid fire tips. So I'm going to do a bunch of rapid fire tips. And then, you know, at the end, we'll have some questions. So here's some things I've done really, really well that I haven't seen people do. So I basically have package previous Twitter threads into lead magnets that have done really well. So here, I basically had three threads that had done really well. I said, hey, do you want three threads that will teach you more than a marketing class? If you want the PDFs of these three threads, just retweet this and I'll DM it for free, right? So this had over a thousand retweets, 
had, uh, you know, 194,000 impressions. And this just drove tons of people. So if we look here, this drove 1,800, when it says sales, this was a free thing. So it drove 1,800 uh, signups. So what happened was people would retweet this. Then I would auto DM them saying, hey, here's a link. This will make this thing free. Instead of it being $29, it makes it $0. And then there was 1,800 people that ended up actually giving me their email and downloading this thing. So just repurposing and repackaging stuff that you've done before is a really great way to kind of double dip and drive traffic in a meaningful way. Um, Twitter threads to LinkedIn carousels, right? Don't reinvent the wheel. A lot of us have been creating probably first on Twitter. It's so easy to create carousels on LinkedIn from Twitter threads. Or vice versa, if you're native to LinkedIn, you want to build out on Twitter, go take your carousels and turn them into Twitter threads. So I'm all about working smart, not working hard, just leveraging content, turning a newsletter into tweets, turning a thread into a newsletter or a LinkedIn post or you know an Instagram post. The more that you can be creative and work smart, the better. Uh, leveraging your other channels to cross promote. So you know I have 20 something thousand people on my Instagram. So I wanted to promote my Twitter. On my LinkedIn, I wanted to promote my Twitter. So just different platforms to push traffic to different mediums really do help. Uh, leveraging other people's audience. So this, there was this guy that named Jose. He, this was back from uh, April of last year. He, had, he only had 3,000 followers. He had DM me saying, I know you're busy. I'm a fan of your work. I've been following you for a while. Um, I'm putting together this really great high quality content. I have you know a few really high target people involved. Would you like to share content? So I said, sure, why not? So he then posted this thing and he had almost a thousand likes, 277 retweets, 19 quote retweets. So he punched way above his weight at the time with only 3,000 followers because he curated you know other influencers posts. And because we spent time giving him content, we all engaged and we helped him grow. So he's also done this really well on LinkedIn. So leveraging other people's audiences. Twitter ads. So one thing that I do that I haven't seen a lot of people do, if you follow me on Twitter, you've probably seen this, is I run Twitter ads on my organic content following my own targeters, uh, my own followers. So I'm running like a couple right now that you've probably seen where I'm only targeting my own followers because they're probably more likely to engage. And when they engage, it then shows their followers. And when they you know, fill something out, it just converts at a higher rate and for cheaper. So I'm running Twitter ads and there's just this example under additional options to target your own followers. Um, so mid-thread newsletter promotion. So earlier I talked about doing it at the end. Um, my friend, Abi, he actually was really clever. So he was doing a thread and in the middle of the thread, he goes, um, by the way, here's a quick plug for my newsletter. And then he goes now back to my content. So most people, if you look at the impressions of a Twitter thread, most number of people are going to look at the first tweet and the fewest number of people are going to make it to the very end. So he basically was like, look, I know that's the case. I'm going to plug in the middle of it and take a quick break and try to drive a call to action. And then you also can do it at the end if you want to. Um, so again, I mentioned this before, but the key here, why this works so well is I prompted engagement and it triggered a DM. So asking people to engage and giving them an incentive to engage will make the post inherently do better because for them to unlock the thing that they want, they have to do what you want. Uh, social proof is powerful. So here was a cool newsletter plug that um, Caitlin did where basically you know, she said, hey, here's my newsletter. A lot of people like it. This many people like it. Allison likes it. And then Allison kind of had a testimonial of it. So this is just a really powerful way. And I haven't seen a lot of people leveraging this. So great way to plug the newsletter on social with social proof. And then the opposite is true too. You want to drive newsletter traffic to social. So every week on Monday, I have like a hero piece of content that I send in my newsletter and I drive you know, thousands of people from my newsletter over to my LinkedIn post, which then helps my LinkedIn post do better. So we've been talking primarily about social to LinkedIn or sorry, from social to newsletter, it also goes the opposite way. You want to leverage newsletter to drive to your social. Um, and then here's another example of social to newsletter. James Clear, famous author, at the, at the end of all his uh, Instagram posts, 
he has this quick call to action saying, I, I have this newsletter, you know, sign up here. And then I got to imagine, right, you know, 11,000 people liked it. There probably is hundreds of thousands of people that saw it. There's probably hundreds, maybe if not a few thousand people that will follow this call to action, even though they have to manually just go do it. Uh, partner giveaways. This is another really great way to build your newsletter. Um, I did this newsletter giveaway with a couple other newsletters. We all promote this you know, $1,000 Amazon giveaway gift card. Um, we all promote it. And then instead of you know me being able to drive X number of people and that be it, you know, four newsletters were able to contribute to it and we drove thousands of people. And you know, a percentage of those are net new for everyone in it. Cross promotion. So, you know, finding other newsletters to promote you and you promote them. So in my newsletter, I have recommended newsletters. It's newsletters that I like, that I enjoy, that I'll reach out to, or they'll reach out to me, and we'll just cross promote each other. Really great, easy way to drive subs because typically a newsletter subscriber will subscribe from a newsletter to another um, probably more often than through running like an ad or something on Facebook. So the, the similar channel, a Slack kind of attracts a similar channel. Okay. So email newsletter. So um, I'm just going to kind of share a couple things like on what I do with my newsletter. So I shared, how do you build the newsletter from social? And whatnot. And now I'm going to talk about how I run my newsletter, and then we'll we'll kind of finish with some Q and A. So I send my newsletter three times per week. I started with once a week. I think it's really important to start with the cadence that you can commit to, um, and and stick to. So you can start with a monthly newsletter. You can start with a bi monthly. You can start with a weekly. For me, I started with a once a week, and then I went to two, and after that, I went to three. And I'll probably stick at about three. I think three is the right amount and the right cadence. Where there are a lot of work to do. And I don't want to send a daily one. It kind of might overwhelm subscribers. And then I also have with that, that's my auto, that's my campaigns. And then I have automations. So I have my automation set up that set, send people various courses of mine at different points in their journey. So for example, after people open 10 emails of mine, they will receive five emails over five days to buy my main course. Um, this is a screenshot from you know a couple months ago. It's a little bit more now. But one of my automations for one of my courses on autopilot has done $53,379. Um, I think now it's at 60 or 70,000. It's something I created like a, I don't know, maybe a year ago that I haven't thought about or touched since that just automatically sends without me thinking about it and remembering about it. And then after the above, they then go into another automation two weeks later where I send them five, uh, three emails over five days and I introduce them to other courses of mine. So for example, example um, this is the automation. I'll show you that in one second but the frequency. So I mentioned this before, but it's easier to start with fewer and then ramp up your sends for starting with more than cutting back. And I typically think of each of my newsletter as a theme. So I have a theme or a topic for each newsletters. Typically, Monday is all about email marketing and copywriting. Thursday typically is focused on email marketing. Friday is focused on copywriting. So I've got different themes and topics for each newsletter. Um, and sometimes they overlap. And then with the automations I was talking about, right? Here's the, the the ones they receive. So they receive like an email about my blueprint. They receive an email about how you know people have gone from 10K to 100K months from this course. How this is the biggest ROI in e-commerce. And how you can watch me build campaigns and it's an overlooked shoulder. So I kind of just talk about these within the newsletter. Um, and this has been a really great way. And I kind of have the logic in place that someone has you know received and opened 10 emails. That way I've built enough value and enough trust because the 10 emails they've received, there's no selling. It's just value. So I want to build the value and the trust and give, give, give before I make an ask. And the ask is something that's going to benefit other people. So I kind of just talk about, right, like here's this and that, right? And kind of each email is just plain text, has a little bit of an offer um, and kind of just has some urgency to it. You know, here's a different automation, right? So after people go through this first one, two weeks later, they then receive three emails over the course of a couple of days that introduces them to other courses of mine, you know, incorporating social proof, et cetera. Um, and then I'll run specific kind of sporadic promotional campaigns um, promoting a course. So, you know, this was like a random flash sale I did. Um, this was uh, three emails over two days and this, you could see like one email at three grand, two grand, seven grand, right? So you know, these 
flash sales would do 10, 15, 20 grand. And I do them maybe once a quarter, if I remember. All right, that's what I've got. Any Q&A? Um, and this is kind of the eight fig link. Uh, I don't remember if Katie talked about eight fig or not, but do we want to do Q&A or eight fig real quick? Um, we can go into Q&A. Um, cool. Yeah, we'll do Q&A. So we have a few questions in the chat um, and then the Q&A box. So I'll just run through a couple of these for you. Um, so one of the first questions we got is, um, is sending so many emails feel like we're spamming people? What is that kind of your advice on that? Yeah, I think like I, I touched at the end, I know that question was asked a lot earlier in the, in the presentation. Like I think you start with fewer emails, you gauge behavior, you know, opens, clicks, conversions are the positive things. And then the negative things would be things like unsub, mark to spam, bounce. Um, you, you just monitor the metrics. So if they all look good, start sending a second email per week, send a third email per week. And then as you notice, like the metrics start to dip and kind of take a hit, then that's kind of how you find your equilibrium. So it's just as simple as starting with one and kind of sending two, three, and then just looking at the data, monitoring your inbox, seeing if people are responding, giving feedback. Um, for some brands, maybe it's once a week. For other brands, it could be five times a week. Most of our clients that do between, you know, a minimum of a million dollars a year, upwards of a couple hundred million dollars a year, they're typically sending, sending a minimum of two to three emails a week, upwards of, you know, a daily email. But because of segmentation, that doesn't necessarily mean that one person receives all the emails. I'd say one person at max probably receives two to four emails a week at max. Cool. Thanks. Um, all right. So our next question on here was um, they want to build their social profile in a stealth mode. Um, they said they have a day job. They are kind of building their exit, but they don't really want to, you know, their current business to see it. Uh, so what are your recommendations to create a strong LinkedIn, like second personal brand? Yeah, that's an interesting question. It's probably a common thing. I think that a lot of people that have jobs feel. So I, I totally get that. Um, I think, you know, again, not the, obviously not the best, not the most ideal. It would be better if you could just build it on your own, but like maybe building out like a LinkedIn page, potentially some kind of like persona or some kind of business or some kind of like personality, like on LinkedIn, I own probably in the ballpark of eight to 10 pages. One is a page called daily copywriting and it's just a daily copywriting tip. Another page is called AI evolution and it's daily, it's daily kind of AI tips and tricks. One page is called marketing tip. So I think like even just creating out like a page that's a little bit more ambiguous and vague and the fact that like it doesn't have your name and face over it, not ambiguous and vague and the fact that like it should be topic centric. Um, I don't know if you focus on Amazon or if you focus on, you know, email or you focus on X, Y, and Z, but I think building out like a page uh, on, on LinkedIn might be a good way to do it. So that way you can create content, share content and create it. Um, versus it having to be like your name and your face and then all your coworkers and your employers can see it. Awesome. Moving along, because we have a lot of questions. So I don't want to try to hit everybody's. Cool. Um, so someone said, you know, they already have a, a newsletter on LinkedIn. Do they need to create a separate newsletter? And do they need to share different or same content? Or how does that work? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think owning your own audience, I think having like your newsletter off of LinkedIn is great. Because on LinkedIn, you don't own the emails, right? Like you're relying on LinkedIn to show that newsletter content to people. And I know they send like a notification, they do send an email, but I always believe in owning your assets. So I started with my own newsletter, LinkedIn newsletters have become a newer thing. Um, I'll repurpose content from my LinkedIn newsletter, or sorry, from my regular newsletter onto LinkedIn. I'll be a little bit more promotional and kind of a little bit more trying to move people over from LinkedIn newsletters, my own newsletter. So I think it's kind of a hybrid. I think some of the stuff's the same and some of the stuff's different. But my goal and the way that I view the LinkedIn stuff is just an extra channel to take advantage of the stuff I'm already creating and trying to move and pour people over. Awesome. Um, so we have a couple people who asked, um, you know, what the best like newsletter automation, email automation, you know, platform should they be using? Yeah, like in terms of email platform, one that we're starting to use a lot is one called Sendlane, S-E-N-D-L-A-N-E. -E. Um, they're a Clavio competitor. We're liking them better, better price, better deliverability, better support. I'm happy to connect you with their team. They're doing some really cool stuff. So if anyone wants an intro to Sendlane, if they're looking for a good email platform, uh, send me an email. I'll drop my email in the chat right now. Cool. I just dropped that in the chat. Awesome. 
Cool. Uh, so moving along. So someone asked, you know, what are the KPIs for email marketing? Yeah, I think there's a couple things, um, right? Like open rates to some degree, right? Like open rates because of iOS 15 aren't hundred percent accurate, but there are some filters you can put in place to get a sense of um, a little bit more accuracy of it. So opens, clicks, conversion rates, you know, revenue per recipient. Um, you know, you want to look at things like unsubs, marked as spam, bounces. So those are like the, the metrics in terms of like, how do you monitor emails? And then the goal, right, is like trying to make 25, 30, 35%, right? So somewhere between like a quarter and a third of your revenue from your retention marketing. You know, if you also do SMS, maybe SMS should be five to 15% and your own audience, your own retention channels are probably, you know, somewhere between 30, 35, 40% potentially. So like, I think just like, you know, making sure that your email metrics in terms of like delivering are healthy, that the engagement's healthy, and then that they are driving, you know, clicks and revenue uh, for your business or for your client's business. Great. Thank you. Um, so our next question is from Michelle and she said, I am starting a product uh, business from zero. Should I focus on building my social presence first or promote my email list from day zero? Um, you know, I think, I think both, I don't think there has to be like an, or I think it could be an, and like, I think even if you're just collecting emails and you're basically like saying, Hey, we're, we're launching soon. We'll keep you guys notified as we launch. Even if you just have a simple collection for email and you're focusing on social, cause you need a traffic mechanism, right? You need like fa Facebook ads, you need some kind of paid ads, you need influencers, affiliates, social, like organic, you just need something. So I think like building them in tandem is great because that way you take advantage early of all the traffic that you drive to your site. So you could even just preempt people saying like, this is something that I'm building. It's not something that's launching soon for the, the newsletter, but I want to make sure that we have your, your email, your phone number. So that way when we do launch, you know, you're the first to know type of a thing. Awesome. Um, looks like we have about two more questions. So okay. um, I've seen a couple kind of relating to copywriting. So someone asked, you know, what's the best way to learn great copywriting? Um, and then someone said, you know, I'm always stuck on the email. Is email copy good? So if you could just kind of touch on that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, co copywriting, like the best way to learn is just getting your reps in, right? Just writing a lot, writing different types of copywriting, email uh, copy, writing ad copy, writing landing page copy, uh, you know, just typing out different blog copy and then just seeing like which one you're really good at and just getting your reps and practicing long form and short form, um, you know, asking people to do critiques, right. You know, studying some of the copywriting content that I'm putting out. Other people are commenting out. Uh, one of my buddies does like a copywriting training every Thursday night where he teaches you like how to write freelance copy and how to get clients. So I just think there's tons of free and paid resources on the internet that are really great for learning copy. But at the end of the day, you can do tons of studying and tons of reading and tons of learning, but it's just about writing. It's just becoming from comfortable and familiar with your style, with your voice and just understanding it. That's perfect advice. Thanks. Yeah, of course. Um, and then our last question from Angie here is what's the best way to really pick your target audience? I mean, it just depends on like what you do. You have to figure out, you know, if you're, an email marketer trying to build an audience of brands, like you want to create content that would attract brands. Um, if you're an e-commerce brand that has a specific product for, um, you know, health and wellness, it's like, well, who would potentially be the buyers of it? Is, is it men? Is it women? Is it men and women? How old are they? What do they look like? So, you know, I think like depending on what you do, you should be able to reverse engineer or back into who your audience is. Or if you're trying to come up with a product, figure out an audience that you understand that you know, maybe you're the audience, right? So for me, I try to create things around audiences that I know, right? Who are marketers, who are copywriters, who are e-commerce brands? So that way I can solve their problems and speak to their problems. Perfect. Awesome. Well, um, that looks like it's, that's it for questions. Um, Chase, again, really appreciate you always doing these for us and course. hopping on. Um, for those of you who don't know, 8Fig is a funding platform. So if you're looking for, you know, funding for your e-commerce business, please connect with us. Um, you can head over to 8Fig.co um, or chat us on social where, um, you know, we're kind of active on all the things. So definitely connect with us. Um, again, Chase, thank you so, so much for being here. We really appreciate it. And uh, thank you to the audience for tuning thank in. You. And we hope to do one of these soon. Yeah, thank you, 8Fig and Katie. And thank you everyone for listening. I appreciate you guys. All righty, everyone have a great day. See you soon. All right, bye. Bye.